It's old school right there. Clash the craniums. Uh, looking at the lower extremity right now, Matt Condo. Matt, wait, explain to the audience who you are and what you get to do. Where are you these days geographically? Geographically, I'm located in Bowling Green, Kentucky. That's where I live. Um, I was a professor at Western Kentucky University for a couple of years. And now I am developing the first PT program at Texas A&M. So I work remotely. My campus is based in Texarkana, Texas, which is a lovely place in this country. Um, and right now I am writing CAPTI accreditation documents and curriculum mapping and for the first program in Texas A&M's history, um, which is a huge kind of a legacy That's accomplishment. A um, we're going to take our first class in January 26, and we're super excited. Excited. All right. So we've done this before. We've done sort of online trivia for students who are in PT school or preparing to sort of transition out of PT school and take the NPTE. And what we've found is sharing content via video and doing it in quiz format makes it fun and lets people learn uh, some really important topics. So we've created a quiz for people to take. Um, and you've put this through. The format will be is we'll present you with the question. We'll give you a bit, 10 to 15 seconds to sort of think about it on your own. And then we'll reveal the right answer and we'll make sure people understand the more most important part. Why is that the right answer? Why is that thing the right answer? Um, so you ready to kick this thing off? I'm ready if you are. Let's do it. Hit it. Question number one. All right, which of the following muscles attaches to the anterior superior iliac spine, the ASIS? Is it rec fem? Is it sartorius? Is it pectineus? I think I know this one. I think I know this one because it's got to be do. hip flexor, right? Right. And I think it's sartorius, right? There's the Taylor's muscle, and that's, that's the correct. longest muscle in the body. Isn't that right? That is correct. It is the longest muscle in the body. It is the correct answer is sartorius and where students get this one confused a lot of times is the difference between the ASIS and the AIIS, right? Anterior superior iliac spine versus anterior inferior iliac spine. Rectus femoris attaches to the anterior inferior iliac spine while sartorius attaches to the anterior superior iliac spine. They're literally right next to each other but they are huge in terms of clinical implications for avulsion fractures and things like that. Perfect. All right. So good, uh, good starting question. I haven't screwed up too bad yet. What I'm we proud got? of you, Jimmy. Thank you. All right. Next question. Uh, question two of 19. Play along. Which of the following muscles is innervated by the femoral nerve? Hmm. Nerve questions, nerve questions. How do you suggest students study for this one? Is it just, is this rote memorization or? I actually recommend compartmentalization because the nice thing about the human body is that there's a lot of patterns, right? So if you notice that certain compartments of muscles will have a lot of common innervation patterns. So if you know the compartment you're in, a lot of times you're going to know the action. A lot of times you're going to know the innervation. So muscle innervated by the femoral nerve, not adductor longus, not gracilis. The answer is pectineus. Yeah, it is pectineus. And the strange thing about this one, and what I tell anatomy students to watch out for, is even though pectineus a lot of times is grouped in with the adductor muscles or that medial compartment, it's actually innervated by the femoral nerve. So it's kind of a weird one. Perfect. Moving on. Staying in the lower extremity here. Next question up. Which of the following structures separates the gluteus medius and minimus muscles? Ooh, I don't think, I don't think I'd even have a, a, a place to start with this one. Is it superior gluteal artery and nerve, inferior gluteal artery and nerve, internal pudendal nerve? Oh man. Ah, uh, I don't know where to start with this one. Superior. See, I was going to lean toward inferior. Why is superior gluteal artery and nerve? Why is that right? So it's right because the gluteus minimus and gluteus medius muscles are both innervated by the superior gluteal nerve and they get blood supply from the superior gluteal artery. Gluteus maximus is the muscle that's innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve and gets a blood supply from the 
inferior gluteal artery. This is really important for dry needling, right? So if you dry needle someone's gluteus medius and you see bright red blood or oxygenated blood start coming out, it means that you have pierced the superior gluteal artery. So that's a big, big deal. That's a no-no. Big no-no. All right, next up. Here's the question, which of the following is the correct orientation working from medial to lateral in the femoral triangle? Oof, medial to lateral. This is tough to do quick. I remember the acronym I was taught was navel. Mm -hmm. All the uh, things that are in the femoral triangle. Medial to lateral, femoral triangle. What's in it? All right, so from medial, femoral vein, artery, nerve. Right. So the way that I typically remember it is you already touched on one of these, which is navel. And that's the orientation lateral to medial. So I always say navel goes in towards the navel. Or if you look at V-A-N, vein, artery, nerve, the van goes out. The van goes from medial to lateral. Got it. So, so it's, it's a nice little mnemonic. But this is really important as well because if you're going to, again, dry needle someone's hip region, really kind of feel for where that pulse is. If you feel that pulse, then you need to know that the next structure lateral to it is going to be the femoral nerve. And that's something you really don't want to needle in a patient. That's going to cause an ouchie. All right, next up. Which of the following muscles performs external rotation of the hip? Is it glute max, tensor fascia lata, or rec fem? External rotation of the hip, which muscle? And the answer is glute max. I think this is an important one to remember. This is a big one to remember because a lot of folks will associate glute max with extension. And glute max is a very powerful extensor of the hip. But if you look at the fiber orientation, the fiber orientation is in an oblique or diagonal angle, which means that that muscle is going to have multiple actions in multiple planes. So glute maximus is actually a really powerful external rotator as well. Perfect. Question six. The sciatic nerve is actually made up of which two nerves? Is it deep fibular and femoral, tibial and deep fibular, or tibial and common fibular? Sciatic nerve is made up of which two nerves? And the answer, tibial and common fibular. And the important thing to remember with this is that the sciatic nerve is not really a nerve, but it's two nerves that are bundled in a common sheath. And kind of bridging off of that, in anatomy language, anytime you see the word common, that means that that structure is going to split into two, right? Oh, so, you know, if you think about in common English, we have communicate, we have commerce, we have a lot of words that have com in it, which always means that there's going to be two parties involved. So a common fibular nerve is then going to split into the superficial fibular and the deep fibular. But the traditional sciatic nerve is the tibial and the common fibular. Did not know that. Next you know question. Now. You know now. Question seven, and here it is. What does the word piriformis mean in English? Oh, man, you're going back to English now. And who I'm studied Latin? Latin? Piriformis. Uh, is it little muscle? Is it pear shaped? Or is it pelvic floor? I'm going to lock in my guess. I think it's pear shaped. Catholic school, Latin and Greek. Got me close enough. Hey, Jimmy, I did my 12 years in Catholic school too. You are exactly right, right? That's pear shaped is what piriformis means. Anytime we see the word form, that's going to mean shape in Latin. And a pira is a pear. So on a lab exam, if you get it confused, 
just think about that everything in the human body is named based on what it looks like, where it is, or what it does. All right, let's move on to the next question. Which of the following hip ligaments limits hip extension? Which of the following hip ligaments limits hip extension? Is it ischiofemoral ligament, iliofemoral ligament, or pubofemoral ligament? So this is a nice question that feels like more like the NPTE because it's asking you what is it and how does it work? And iliofemoral ligament, walk us through the thought process here if you're, if you're seeing this on a test. Absolutely. Okay, so the first thing to remember is that the iliofemoral ligament also goes by another name. It also goes by the name of the Y ligament of Bigelow, right? So if you see that on NPTE, Y ligament of Bigelow is nothing but the iliofemoral ligament. The other thing is the iliofemoral ligament is the only ligament that's in the front of the hip. So if you think about it, if it's in the front of the hip, it's going to get shortened when a patient or a person performs hip flexion but it's gonna get lengthened when someone does hip extension. Well, also think about what the job of the ligament is, right? The job of the ligament is to reduce or limit the motion between bones at a joint. So when the iliofemoral ligament is stretched, it's going to limit hip extension because it's sitting in the front. Good walkthrough. Thank you. About halfway there. Next question up. Which of the following hip conditions is the result of a reduced femoral head to shaft angle? Which of the following hip conditions is the result of a, of a reduced femoral head to shaft angle? Is it coxa valga, coxa vera, or coxa algia? All right, coxa vera. Walk us through this. Because I feel so, like we can get tossed up between valga and vera. Absolutely. Right. So the throwaway answer on this one's algae, because algae just means pain. So you really can reduce this one down to two plausible answers, valga or vera. Remember what valga means and remember what vera means. Okay. So valga is going to be towards the midline. Vera is going to be away from the midline. In terms of the hip, the Femoral neck or femoral head to shaft angle should be somewhere between 120 to 125 degrees in a normal person. A reduction of that, so if the patient has a coxa vera, they're going to have a femoral head to shaft angle of around 90 degrees or sometimes less. Coxa valga is going to be much more than 125 degrees. Right? This becomes important because we will see certain different pathologies with coxa vera, such as femoral neck fractures, because there's, if you think about it, an increase in lever arm because there is a sharper angle, right, at the femoral neck. Coxa valga is going to have different pathologies, such as maybe femoral acetabular impingement syndrome or another pathology involving more impaction because the femur is simply just straighter and so there's going to be more impact directly into the acetabulum. All right, up next. All right, which of the following ligaments shares an attachment with the sacrotuberous ligament? Which of the following ligaments shares an attachment with the, with the sacrotuberous ligament? Glute max, glute min, or glute min. It's glute max. It is right. glute max. 50 50 choice, but that mm -hmm. should have helped you. Absolutely it should have helped you, right? So I gave you a gimme here. So so with all ligaments, we really have to look at the ligament. And the ligaments are really nice because they are literally named based on what two bones they attach together, right? Or what two bony landmarks they attach together. In terms of the sacrotuberous ligament, it literally attaches the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity. Well, then you have to start thinking about, well, what muscles are down near the ischial tuberosity? Well, glute max is right there. The hamstring proximal attachment is right there. 
and there's not a whole lot else, right, that attaches right there. Well, if you think about it, if the glute max has a sacrotuberous ligament attachment, that's actually going to help it in terms of its pull mechanism, right? It's actually going to have a little str a stronger pull and therefore able to produce a little more power. It's not going to help something like the hamstrings because the hamstrings are kind of a straight line muscle that are very long and they need a long lever arm to produce. So anything that's going to reduce that long lever arm is actually going to reduce its power. So the only plausible answer here really is glute max. All right, up next, which of the following anatomic spaces contains the piriformis muscle? Interesting. Which of the following anatomic spaces contains the piriformis muscle? Obturator canal, lesser sciatic foramen, greater sciatic foramen. And the answer is greater sciatic foramen. Foreman. All right. Anatomic spaces, piriformis, greater sciatic foramen. So these are really important because based on the different foramen or different openings that we have in our bodies, there are different structures that pass through them. The piriformis is really important because it actually attaches, its proximal attachment is to the anterior sacrum, right? So it's actually, it's not considered part of the pelvic floor, but it attaches inside of your pelvis. Then it travels through the greater sciatic foramen on its way out to the hip. The greater sciatic foramen is also really important because the piriformis muscle itself serves as a landmark for which all of the other structures that pass through the greater sciatic foramen are named. So for example, we already went through the superior gluteal nerve and superior gluteal artery, as well as the inferior gluteal nerve and artery. Those are named based on their position relative to piriformis, right? So if I have a piriformis spasm that's happening or I have a patient that has some piriformis problems, I need to think about what structures are passing above it or below it or through it that could possibly be aggravated as well. All right, question number 12. What is the source of the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries? Looking for the source of the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries. Femoral profunda artery, femoral artery, obturator artery, getting into the cardiovascular. Source of medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries, femoral profunda artery. So this one's important because we need to understand not only what parts of our bodies are being supplied by blood, but also where those blood supplies are coming from. So let's think about a patient that has avascular necrosis, right? So what is avascular necrosis? Necrosis meaning death of tissue, avascular meaning without blood. So if we look in a chart and we see an angiogram or we see the re results of an angiogram, and it says that patient has a blockage of the femoral artery or they have a blockage of the obturator artery or what have you, we need to know what other structures are supplied by that blood and that vessel because we may see problems there as well. So understanding where these sources of blood are is extremely important, even though a question like this seems like kind of a line item or kind of an in the weeds question on anatomy test. Question 13, staying in lower extremity. Which of the following nerves innervates the medial compartment of the thigh? Medial compartment of the thigh. Obturator nerve? Is it femoral nerve or tibial nerve? Which of the following nerves innervates the medial compartment of the thigh? Obturator, femoral, tibial. And the answer is... Obturator nerve. Why is that the right answer? So that's the right answer is simply because we need to know what compartments we're in, right? So the obturator nerve is going to come out of the lumbar plexus. It's going to travel through the obturator canal. It's going to travel through the obturator foramen, and that's going to hit the obturator section or the medial section of the thigh, right? So if we know what compartment we're in, 
that's a nice little shortcut that if I'm in the middle compartment, I got a really good chance that all of those muscles, or at least most of those muscles, are innervated by the obturator nerve. Right, the femoral nerve is going to innervate the anterior compartment of the thigh and the hip, and the tibial nerve is going to innervate the posterior compartment of the hip and the thigh. All right, next question. Which of the following muscles medially rotates the tibia at the knee joint? Which of the following muscles medially rotates the tibia at the knee joint? Is it biceps femoris, rectus femoris, or semimembranosus? Medially rotates the tibia. This one a little harder. Answer is semimembranosus. All right, walk me through this one. Absolutely. So remember that semimembranosus, along with semitendinosus and biceps femoris, make up the hamstring group. The hamstring group all has a very similar proximal attachment at the ischial tuberosity at the hip. However, as the hamstrings start traveling distally, semimembranosus and semitendinosus stay on the medial side, and biceps femoris travels all the way down and goes down to the lateral side. So this becomes very important because if my patient, for example, has a hamstring repair of their ACL, I need to know exactly what muscle they took that from and what compartment they took that from because at least in my clinical experience, that patient that has a hamstring graft has a ton of issues later on strengthening their hamstring muscles. So if we understand where that patient may have some problems in those little detail, mo detail motions, so such as tibial medial rotation versus lateral rotation, we're going to be able to target exactly what muscles involved. All right, up next. Which of the following muscles also flexes the femur at the hip joint? Flexes the femur at the hip joint. Gracilis, adductor longus, pectineus. So looking for another flexor of the femur at the hip. The answer is pectineus. See, I would have got that one wrong. Well, so here's what you really need to think about. With gracilis and adductor longus, think about the fiber orientation, right? They're very long muscles, but they're also very straight muscles. Pectineus, however, is kind of like diagonally oriented muscle. And like I said earlier, a muscle that's diagonally oriented in terms of muscle fiber is going to have multiple motions, right? So if you just kind of think about each of the fiber orientations, you at least have kind of a guessing chance of what, what mo which one of those muscles is actually going to have multiple motions, right? So in this case, pectineus, and pectineus is a weird muscle, right? It's considered part of the medial compartment, but it is innervated by femoral nerve. It is innervated by a femoral nerve, but it also does hip adduction, but it also does hip flexion, right? So pectineus is kind of a strange one. All right, question 16. The adductor hiatus is an opening in which of the following muscles? Adductor hiatus, an opening in which of the following muscles? Adductor magnus, adductor longus, or adductor brevis? And there's, there's a reason you're asking about the hiatus. Something probably runs through there, which we'll get into, but which one of them is an, the hiatus is an opening in which muscle? And it's the magnus. Yep. It definitely is magnus. And the reason this is important because in that adductor hiatus, that's where the femoral artery runs through. So the femoral artery is very important because it's going to supply the entire lower extremity with blood distal to the thigh, right? So if you have that patient that they have a cold foot or some cyanosis, their foot's blue, there's a good possibility that the femoral artery is going to get shut off or is getting shut off. And that's extremely important as well, because if you're reading an angiogram and you see that patient has a femoral artery occlusion, or even also remember that the adductor hiatus is important because that's where the femoral artery is going to change names to the popliteal artery. So if you see the patient has a popliteal artery infarct as well, start thinking maybe there's a problem with adductor magnus. 
All right, next question, 17. Which of the following muscles is not part of the iliopsoas? Psoas minor, psoas major, iliacus. This is tough. Following muscles, not part of the iliopsoas. Psoas minor, major, or iliacus. And the answer is psoas minor. All right. Help me understand it and why is it important? So this is important because psoas major, and really if you think about it in terms of anatomic language, right? Most of these terms are descriptors. So if a muscle has something called major, then it's probably going to have a minor, right? If something has a superior, it's probably going to have an inferior, right? So the first clue is look for those descriptors because a lot of times they're going to tell you that there's a partner muscle along with it. So as major is the muscle that goes all the way down to the lesser tuberosity or lesser tubercle of the hip or the femur and will actually perform hip flexion. So as minor and fun fact about so as minors, not everyone has one, right? It's huh. absent in about a third of the population. It is not even going to make it all the way down to the hip. It's going to attach on the pelvis and it's not going to have any effect on the hip whatsoever. So psoas major and iliacus are the muscles that come together to form iliopsoas. Question number 18. Which of the following muscles attaches to the head of the fibula? Now, which of the following muscles attached to the head of the fibula? Is it semitendinosus, semimembranosus, or biceps femoris? Head of the fibula, biceps femoris. So I gave a clue with this one earlier with that medial rotation of the tibia question, right? I said earlier that semimembranosus and semitendinosus travel down to the medial side of the back of the knee while biceps femoris travels down to the lateral side. If we really think about it, the fibula is on the lateral side of the leg, right? So in orientation purposes, my tibia is more medial, my fibula is more lateral. So really there's only one logical answer for this and that's the biceps femoris. Clinically, this is very important because if my patient has a fibular head fracture, I can't just think about all the muscles that are distal to it. Right. I can't think about gastroc and soleus and peroneus longus and peroneus brevis and muscles like that. I also have to think about biceps femoris because there's an attachment there. All right. Last question of the day. Which of the following motions would maximally stretch the sartorius muscle? All right, good combinations there. Hip extension, external rotation, abduction, or is it flexion, internal rotation, hip abduction, hip extension, internal, or adduction? This one, understanding what the actions are and understanding the opposites of that. Jimmy, you're exactly right. So if we know the actions of a muscle, then the opposites of those actions are going to stretch the muscle. Right. So if you think about what the actions of sartorius are, and you said it at the beginning of our podcast, it's the Taylor's muscle, right? It's going to flex, it's going to externally rotate, it's going to abduct because it kind of puts me in that Taylor's position. If I want to maximally stretch that muscle, I need to perform hip extension, hip internal rotation, and hip adduction. So very good job. I would like to know from people watching in the comments if they found it helpful, if they were playing along, those sorts of things. Matt Kondo, thank you for uh, doing Clash of the Craniums again with us. Thank you, Jimmy. It's a pleasure as always.